Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5. Father, today we come into your presence acknowledging we have a great God. Today, teach us, help us to know you, help us to understand Jesus. We say thank you that your love is overwhelming to us, that your love teaches us. We rely on your love through the power of the Spirit of God. We say thank you and we love you. We pray this in the holy name of our Lord Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Well, good morning and happy Mother's Day. We're going to come back to Mother's Day in just a, a few moments. Thank you for joining us for this very unique service. We have no fancy taping today. It is in my basement with my iPhone. Uh, last week I put Austin into quarantine, not to mention our mission speakers, Chris and Tara Lynn Orickson, who I very much appreciate. They came out and fortunately after they came to see us, they had to go into quarantine for two weeks. Um, but as many of you no doubt are aware, I have, have given a positive COVID di diagnosis. Um, some may be tuning in today just out of curiosity to see if I'm alive. <clears throat> I'm going to do my best. My worst symptom right now is that I'm finding it hard to talk, which makes it quite difficult for a preacher. Uh, I understand why so many with COVID end up uh, on oxygen. Uh, as a church, we are officially in an outbreak. Um, I'm a little unclear as to exactly when we entered it and when we're going to come out of it. Um, but uh, I've been in lots of discussions with Alberta Health Services as well as our local health inspector this week, and they've all been very supportive and helpful. And we may be online for a couple of weeks um, as we are technically a workplace outbreak. Our Revelation Bible study on Wednesdays is still going on. All the other Bible studies, keep an eye on our website for, for updates, but they are not happening at the moment. I'm legally obligated to stay out at the church for at least another week, or at least to the end of this next week. Um, but you know what? I was in a discussion the other day on the phone, obviously, uh, about God's attributes. And we we're talking about these characteristics of God. What makes God unique? And the most important one of them <coughs> is that God is love. And the reason why we'd say that's the most important is because how we relate to God. Uh, God is at work in remarkable ways. And he will use this pandemic to deepen our love for him. Perhaps it might be partially us being willing to sacrifice so that we can be cautious about further spreading the virus. Part of it might be in ways that we don't yet understand. I think the church is getting a chance to kind of re-examine its priorities. And perhaps the church, not, not just Lamont, but the church in general, needs opportunities periodically to put our eyes fully back on Jesus and not on the things of this world. We need to see that as people who live as light in an increasingly hostile world, that God is on our side and that God is leading us somewhere unique. In other words, God works in a pandemic and it may be inconvenient and it may be uncomfortable at times, but it's good. And we're going to look at a scripture in a few moments that if it's true, Perhaps we'll be able to say, come out of this and say, the church came out of this a little bit weaker. And that's a good thing. Thank you for everyone who's kind of checked in with Zoe and I and made sure we're okay. Um, we're going to do music a little different. Obviously, I don't have a worship team down here with me. Um, I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to suggest a couple of songs that I've given YouTube links to in both the email or both uh, the website and on the uh, comment section of the YouTube site. Um, two different songs. That's what I did in the first lockdown. Uh, was suggest a couple of songs to sit, listen in on. First one's a little bit newer and a little bit rockier, but with powerful lyrics that are going to fit this morning. Grace wins. 
story and the song, while there's a war between guilt and grace for a sacred space. The second one I'm going to suggest is a great old hymn, one of my favorites, Grace Greater Than All Our Sins. Again, happy Mother's Day to the moms out there. Our second Mother's Day where many of you are separated from your kids. And I know that there is so many different stages of motherhood in our church, and I appreciate each stage that uh, different mothers are in. May God truly bless you. I love the fact that the province canceled school just in time for Mother's Day. Wasn't that a nice gift? We'll pray for you in our main prayer time in just a moment. But thank you, moms, for all you do. I would say dads do all the work today, except that'd be a little hypocritical because I'm not allowed up in my kitchen. I'm actually separated from Zoe at the moment just because of COVID. Um, I should clarify that the whole separated. Yes, it's because of COVID. Um, so Zoe still has to do it all. Maybe I'll give her Father's Day off. I, I know I can't see my mother. Um, best I can see with my wife is occasionally she drops food off at the bottom of the stairs for me and collects my dishes and goes off and sanitizes them and her. Done all without getting COVID so far. But we know the moms do a lot of work. We appreciate all that you do. I want to read a little passage out of Isaiah chapter 11. Uh, this, is, <coughs> this is often a Christmas passage. Or at least one we read at Christmas, but it's one that really applies all the time. Starting in Isaiah 11, starting in verse 1. It's about the perfect judge. It was not you or I, but Jesus. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness. He shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. He shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. Father, we come before you knowing that you're overwhelming to us. Thank you that you are judge, that you are the one in control. We come before you and look to you for wisdom, for strength, for hope, for love. May you be with us as we come through this service of worship. May we understand Jesus a little deeper because we tuned in today. Thank you for all that we have in your holy name. Father, be with those who are not well, those who are struggling, those who are grieving. And we know there are many in our midst who are like that. Father, thank you that we know you touch us in our moments of weakness and help us to be hopeful and well. And we thank you for the great hope that allows us to see Jesus Christ and allows us to be blessed by the Holy Spirit. Give us the ability to submit to you, put aside the things of this world, we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Looking to this morning at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, I planned this sermon series out long in advance, and I entitled this morning's sermon, Guessing the Effects of Sunshine, which is ironic, because I'm stuck in the basement, robbed of most sunlight. We're looking at 1 Corinthians from a gardening perspective, and as I was starting to write my sermon and stuck here in the basement, I, I, I wrote the line down that I was planning to say, just asked the question, is it still, is the sun still shining out there? And I'm not joking, seconds after I typed that out, I got a text message from Clark Marshall that said this, Hi, Darren. The sun is not shining, and it is absolutely not a beautiful morning, in case you don't have a window in your basement. Now, I do have a little window, and I know he was writing this on Thursday. It was a beautiful, sunny day. 
and I could see that, and I have to be honest, I've never accused an elder of actually lying in the service, and I'm not saying he was, because he was being ironic and trying to encourage me that I'm not missing anything out here. Um, but as I think of sunshine, and as I've gone a few days with very little, I did sneak out for a little bit Thursday afternoon and just go and sit in the sunshine. But it reminds us that we really do need the sun, don't we? Sunshine affects us as people. We need sunlight. I've talked a little bit in this sermon series so far about my my shady garden in Viking. And a few years, particularly in the first few years we were there, we used to try to grow corn in one of the sunnier spots of the garden. And it would always get closer, get closer, kind of getting close to right by the time frost would come. And corn was nice because it would grow tall and proud over the weeds. Once it got going, it could overwhelm them. Um, the weeds were closer to the ground. They didn't need quite as much sunlight. Um, but in the garden, weeds choke out that which we want to grow generally. And in 1 Corinthians, we find a church that's struggling because weeds are growing and choking out the things that we need to grow. There, we need the sun to help us to grow beyond the choking capacity of weeds. In the first week in this sermon series, we looked at chapter one and, and we saw that human wisdom, things that, that might be common sense in our world, we need to yank them out because they're a weed. And when we yank out weeds, the plants that we want to grow can flourish. And what flourishes? We pull out this human wisdom. The answer is humility. In 1 Corinthians 2 and 3, a couple weeks ago, we talked about yanking out the weed of our need to be right. And when we yank out this need to be right, what flourishes? The presence of God in our lives. We'll to actually live knowing God is with us. Weeds are the things that keep my attention on, on people, problems, myself, and not on the things that are divine. In the first two, and, and again this week, the weeds that we have to pull out are weeds that have to do with our eyes being on people and their failures, and their promise problems. Because it's so much easier to look at them than deal with our own issues or to go <coughs> deeper with Jesus. Ah, when we deal with other people, sometimes it gives us a false image of ourselves. And the shame of others is a way that I cannot deal, I can, I can worry about something other than my own issues. The sinful nature, nature needs to keep dying so that Christ can grow in our lives. And I cannot do that if I'm fascinated by the sinful nature, whether it's mine or someone else's. And in chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, and if you have your Bible, I invite you to open up to it so you can follow along. We fo it focuses really on human judgments in a couple ways. We can judge others. We can be overly worried about how other people judge us. We can spend a lot of time judging ourselves. They seem like different things, but actually they're all the same issue. We cannot experience the full power of God if we are focused on the wrong that is down here instead of the power of God above. Human judgments of any sort are trying to take God's control. We see that passage in Isaiah right at the beginning about the power of God and him being the perfect judge. He needs to be that perfect judge. Anytime we are judged, we're taking his place and it becomes a weed in the garden. Anytime we're worried about somebody else taking his place, it's a weed in the garden that needs to go. We cannot experience the full power of God 
if I am focused on the weeds and not the plant that God wants to flourish, which is his power. Judging others, judging ourselves, focusing on how people treat me, offenses against me, other people's sins, none of those keep me focused on the eternal. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, starting verse 1, this is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and the stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they are to be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am there, not thereby acquitted. It's the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time before the Lord comes who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purpose of, of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. I've applied all these things myself and, and his, his fellow servant and worker, Apollos, for your benefit. Brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against the other. We need to be recognized and praised. It's just kind of part of human nature. And that has to do with judgment. We need to be judged right. If we are offended by others, when they put us down or they choose poorly, well, that's the same thing. We need to be judged right. If I'm focused on what I am doing that is, is right, I'm saying that I need to be judged rightly. If I focus on what I'm doing wrong, it, it indicates a need within my heart to want to be judged correctly. If I am so concerned with how others perceive me, all of this is one thing. And add that to that a big biblical no-no that often we in the church do not take seriously. Jesus says, do not judge others because it's taking God's place and it keeps us focused on this world. You know, fear of being judged and judging are two sides of one coin. In verse 1 of this chapter 4, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. There's two different words for servant that are used in this verse. And, and they both indicate somebody who is a lead servant. And what's a lead servant's job? Focus on what the boss wants. Focus on the boss's way of doing things because his or her voice is the only one that matters to the servant. Verse 2, moreover, is required of stewards that they be found faithful. We have one job, to be faithful to the boss. And then in verse 3, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. <clears throat> in fact, I do not even judge myself. Any human judgment that I pronounce or is given against me, even if I give it myself, has absolutely no value. I've noticed over the years that those who are the most judgmental are often the same ones who most fear the judgment of others. They're very sensitive to other people disagreeing, they're easily offended, and they can often be very hard on themselves. People kind of always are looking and saying, I'm a failure. They're all interrelated because it's keeping our eyes away from God. The key verse in the first part of this chapter is, Therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, verse 5, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. This is not the time to judge. Jesus will bring to light the darkness. There's an emphasis there on this hidden darkness that we're in. That word hidden in Greek is the word crypto, which is where we get our word cryptic. Who can understand the heart? Not even the, ourselves. And Jesus is the only one who can bring the secret to light, which is a scary idea, except he's writing this to the church. And what happens when things are brought to the light in the church? Commendation, or literally the praise of God. 
when Jesus comes and brings sunlight upon believers, he brings praise. So should we be people who are focused on darkness or on light? If we give judgment, we're focused on the dark places. We're taking God's place. We're removing the sunlight. If we accept the judgment of other people, we are letting them take God's place. All that matters is the master for whom the church comes with commendation. So maybe, just maybe, we should be focusing there. So watch ourselves. Chapter 4, verse 7. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If you, then you received it. Why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you become rich. Without us you become kings. And would the, and would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all like men sentenced to death because we become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. We're fools for Christ's sake. But you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. And we labor, working in our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. There is some biting sarcasm in this. This is a group of believers who are saying, we have it all together. And they claim something much deeper than Paul would dare claim. We live in an age where everyone expects to be an expert in everything and feels the need to tell the world. I've talked to lots of people over the years have said, uh, I've, I've read online that this is what the church believes. Or this is what the Bible says. And I, I, I always, no, it doesn't. Very often, I have to say, no, what you read online is not correct. Um, you know, I've studied the Bible for many decades. I have degrees in it. I, I kind of know that that's not what the Bible's after. Do you want, though? Often the response is, you don't know what you're talking about because some random dude on Twitter said otherwise. And what that random dude on Twitter said is what I want to believe. You can always find somebody who is willing to speak the truth that you want. Paul comes to them and says, okay, fine, you're smarter than me. That's fine. I can be the fool. In verse 10, I am, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago, when he uses the word fool in 1 Corinthians, he's using a word that we use in English. He says, I'm a moron, literally. He says, you're not. <laughs> okay, you're wise. And the word he uses for wise is not the typical word for wise. It's one that's a little deeper. It has to do with you have great insight based on your wisdom. It must be true because you enjoy influence, you enjoy prestige, things are going well for you. Poor Paul. All he knows is persecution and struggle and suffering, sacrifice. So there's two groups here who are disagreeing. Who has God's blessing? The humble, suffering apostle? Or is it this church of know-it-alls but have everything going well for them. Is Paul abandoned by God because things are hard? Sometimes we can feel moral, we can feel things are, are going well in our lives, and I'm going to tell you there are moments of time where there are emotions. I know a lot of churches today that will teach, if you know the things going well, that must mean you have God's blessing on your life. If you have more power, influence, wealth, God must be happy with you. And by logic, if you're persecuted, poor, marginalized, you must be rejected by God. And I, 
I have to be honest, that exists beyond just a small group of churches. I think that exists within society as a whole. It is a way that we kind of look at the world. Therefore, we all try to look like we have it all together. To appear successful, strong, unable to lose an argument, unable to be weak. All signs that I need human praise. I need to be judged a certain way by all mankind. And Paul comes along and says, when I am weak, then Christ is strong. Remember back in the 1980s when the Oilers were such a powerhouse hockey team? And so many would end up going to the games and yelling at the players to shoot more. They would spend their entire time criticizing the players, second-guessing the coaches. And they missed the joy of a dynasty that kept winning because they knew better than those who were at ice level. Fortunately, the players ignored those who were judging them and were only interested in the one whose judgment mattered, and that was the coach. Whose judgment matters for us? Is it everybody else? Or are we strictly concerned with how God sees us? <coughs> Verse 14. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you, Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you as soon as, as, soon as the Lord wills. And I will find out, not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. Watch this. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod, with a spirit of love and gentleness? These days we can listen to many experts, teachers, authors, you can listen to podcasts. That's great. Isn't it great we can learn so much in this day and age? But beyond just learning, we need people to disciple us. Not just to learn facts, we need people in our lives who can walk alongside us, who can examine our life and practices, and to help us find the weeds, to root them out so that God's plans can flourish in our lives. Not just learn, but imitate the life of those who we trust. I read, emphasize that verse 20. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. It's not about hearing what you want to hear. For more, we live in a society where it is easy just to listen to voices that agree with you all the time. That's not healthy. Rather than that, we need to weed out our need to judge, our concerns with those who judge us, and focus on God. And then what God has planted can flourish. It can thrive. It can succeed. We need to yank out the weeds and what will be left behind. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk. All the need to talk about others, to hear about other people talking about us in a certain way, that's not where the kingdom of God resides. The kingdom of God resides in power. So if we yank out the other stuff, what's left behind to flourish? Power. Much in 1 Corinthians about humility. It's what we looked at in chapter 1. That's what flourishes. Isn't it interesting what grows beside humility? Power. Is that odd? Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit. There is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you 
when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you <coughs> falsely on my account. Rejoice, be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Power grows beside humility. Because it is not our power, it is divine power that grows. The word power in the Greek is the word dynamis. It's where we get our word dynamic. Um, about a century and a half ago, there was a Swedish inventor by the name of Alfred Nobel who came up with an invention and he was trying to come up with a name for his invention. So he came to this Greek word and he called his invention dynamite. Now we have to be careful not to read this word through Nobel's invention, but it is interesting that he picked this word. It's an important concept. We love as people to sit around, complain about the world, about leadership, about neighbors, perhaps about family. What are we doing in all those things? We're talking about family. We're talking about people. We're focused on people. We're keeping our eyes below. And the kingdom of God does not consist of talk. We may even be right, or we may not be right, about the things that we're saying about other people. But even if we are right, there are judgments. We have the knowledge now. that We're not there to be judges. We'll leave that to Jesus. But we are to be people who bring power. Knowledge is not all there is to being a disciple. We might know about things. But we're to be like Jesus. The word dynamis. Literally, the, the dictionary de definition is the ability to exert force regarding a function. It would appear the Corinthians like to sit around talking when, when disciples and... Uh, sorry, so... It appear the Corinthians like to sit around talking with each other about all sorts of things that are going on. And Paul is writing saying, you know, what you're talking about is so secondary, you should be concerned with expanding the kingdom of God. And when Paul comes, he will not come just to talk about people, but to push them to show power. We'll expand on this later as we go through 1 Corinthians, but 1 Corinthians pulls out a lot of what does it look like to live in the power of God. We're going to talk about the demonstrations of love. He's going to talk about <coughs> exercising our spiritual gifts. It's about bringing a message of hope to this world. And it can only happen when we are not focused on judging or being judged. Instead, when we leave room for the power of God. In other words, we need less time focused on failures and more time focused on Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. We yank out this root, that we yank out the whole thing, the weed of this concern that we have about other people's thoughts about us, this weed about judging other people, this weed about how we might even judge ourselves. And what's left behind is the power of God. We need to be people continually coming to him with this desire to know him deeper. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the grace and mercy that is so evident in this verse. We thank you for the hope that exists within you. Father, be with us. Send us from here with your blessing, particularly the moms on this Mother's Day. May you bless each one of them. May they know the glory of God in a special way. We thank you that you are good and you are kind. We love you. Father, be with us. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you for sticking with it. I know this is a sermon in which I'm not feeling that great, and so it may not be the best presented sermon, but in the end, no matter how well we do is with preaching, what matters is we come to the Word of God and know it and let it influence all parts of our lives. There's a blessing at the very beginning of 1 Peter chapter 1 that should excite us.
as we look and understand what it means to focus on Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, we read this as our final benediction. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Please take some time to watch the videos with us uh, on music and to worship God together. Thank you for joining us and God bless.